بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي كفى والصلاة والسلام على رسوله المصطفى Truly all praise is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created the human beings as a khalifa as the scholars of tafsir said khalifa meaning those who continue from one generation to another one generation leaves behind another generation as it makes way and goes on to the paradise or to the hereafter for us to be generations after generation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the marriage such that the husband and the wife can put all their efforts what they have learned and benefited in their whole lifetime put it into their marriage raise the next generation the future of humanity and doing that is quite a challenge of course and not an easy thing to do so truly all praises to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only did he create the marriage but he put love and mercy therein such that it gives the people that incentive that motivation that desire to embark into a life of marriage have children and keep going by putting the best effort they can therein therefore I hope we can realize that having love and mercy in our marriage it is so important not only is it important to have love and mercy in our marriage when we get married but also we want to make sure that when we get married with love it continues forever and doesn't just stop there it continues in this life and continues between the husband and the wife in paradise in the eternal life that's what this course is about in love forever an Islamic marriage course the course then is going to be focusing a lot on how to develop this love in marriage before you get married choosing your spouse when you do get married how to have a good start then how to main how to develop the love and maintain that love throughout the marriage and keep it forever by using that marriage to take us to paradise that is what this course is all about having that love mercy and success and happiness in the marriage so then before we begin looking at this it's it's very helpful for us to have a brief look at the fiqh of marriage this course it's not about the fiqh of marriage the course is about having a successful marriage with love and having a marriage for the purpose that Allah built it for created it for so then we're going to proceed this with a small section about the fiqh of marriage and as a result of that because it's just a small section leading into the whole course we will now be doing that in the form of a small voice over PowerPoint video and also people can use that as an audio to listen as well we'll be doing this as an introduction hopefully you can come prepared to the course with this but whether you listen to it before the course or not at least do make sure you do listen to it at some time because what we will be looking at in this course are things that are essential from an Islamic point of view so then we see in front of us the contents page we see in the contents page we begin by having a brief review of the fiqh of marriage brief because as I said this is not the purpose of this course but we are looking at it because we wouldn't understand marriage as it is in Islam if we were not to have a look at the fiqh of marriage albeit briefly so then in this the first of the things we'll be looking at first of the points as you can see on the screen is people who we are prohibited to marry after that we'll be looking at the engagement itself how the engagement is done in Islam very briefly though from a fiqh perspective because as you can see across on the other side later on during the course itself we'll be looking at engagement and getting married in a detailed way between the Islamic way as opposed to the other way of having girlfriends and boyfriends and so on so now in this little video in the introduction we'll be looking at the engagement or khutbah from a fiqh perspective after that we'll have a look at the conditions for a marriage a valid marriage what makes a marriage a proper Islamic marriage what are the etiquettes what are the what is the proper way to do a sunnah marriage after all we do want to start our marriage in a way that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we can have the maximum blessings for the rest of our life we will also be looking at as you see about the mahar then about walima and once we finish looking at marriage itself we'll have a brief look at something that we hope we will not need 
but something that the door that Allah has left open for us in case of a necessity, which is a divorce to end a marriage that was not meant to be. This course is about trying to protect the marriage, keep the marriage successful, beautiful, enjoyable, loving. That's what this course is about. But there are times when divorce is really Islamically even is the best way to go about it. As we will see, for example, Prophet Ibrahim salam, advised his own son Ismail salam, on an instance to divorce his wife. And the Prophet salam, also mentioned in the hadith, as we will see later on during the course, there are times when your spouse is of a certain type, it is best to get a divorce. So then we'll be looking at the divorce after we look at the marriage in this brief review of fiqh of marriage. Divorce itself is of different types. There's divorce, there's khul'ah, and there's fasq, and then there is the raja. We'll have a look at all of these. We'll look at the idda or the waiting period that follows the divorce before the complete separation. We'll look at what happens with the children according to the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who keeps them? The mother does or the father does? What happens to the children? And of course, the financial responsibility of the children as well. And then the property and assets that the husband and wife may have owned while they were married. What happens to them? How are they settled once the marriage comes to an end? If it did come to an end. This is from the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the brief review of fiqh of marriage. You can see on the right hand side on the contents page, some of the topics we'll be doing during the course itself. We'll be beginning by looking at the goals of marriage according to Islam. This, I cannot emphasize the importance of this topic. From, the, from what I've read of the research from the counselors who specialize in marriage, goals of marriage is one of the most important thing. Goals of marriage according to Islam is the most important thing that we all ought to be understanding before we get into the marriage. Then we'll look briefly about how you go about finding a spouse Islamically. How do you go and propose and get engaged? What kind of a wife or a husband you choose? This definitely, I hope you can appreciate, is one of the most important topics as well. Also, we finish off that little section by noticing the importance of parents in Islam such that it's not one extreme nor the other. We'll also have a look at what is the proper time, according to Islam, to get married. After that, we've got an interesting section, as you can see in the contents page. We'll be looking at a view ahead on the different stages of married life. When a person is just married, when they have their first child, when they have further kids, two, three, four children, or, and then as the kids become teenagers, then when the parents themselves move into middle-aged years and then, then them as grandparents. Having a view ahead on stages of married life really helps you to have a look, at a, at, to, to look out the window at where you are heading, what is coming up ahead in your life, so that when you choose your spouse, your husband or your wife, not only is the Islamic guidance important, but it's also good to know where you're heading with respect to your marriage, with respect to your life. So then when you choose your husband and wife, you choose someone who's going to help you and who's going to be the right person for you for the rest of your life as you move through different stages of life. Then we'll be looking at during the day-long intensive Islamic course, we'll be looking at the marriage itself. We begin our marriage and we want to begin in love and we want to keep it forever. So we'll look at beginning the wedding in a halal manner, about the prayers that we do on the first night, prayers that we do at the time of making love, the importance itself of doing dua for one another. And one very important section, as you see in front of you on the screen, is the importance of love and the meaning of marriage. This is something that helps us to appreciate what love really is, what marriage is all about. We'll have a look at that as well because you'll, I'm sure you'll find it very interesting when we do come around to it. Then we'll look at how do we keep the love in the marriage, how to avoid problems in the marriage. How to keep love in the marriage, again, is one of the biggest, most important of the sections. In this section, we'll have a look at some of the advice that even some non-Muslim counselors gave which is something that they've learned only in the recent past, but it's something that Rasul وسلم, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had mentioned more than 1,400 years ago. It's really interesting stuff. We'll have a look at that in the section, 
how to keep the love in marriage. We'll also look after that about how to avoid problems in the marriage. I've got five golden rules that really do help us to try to avoid problems in the marriage. Now you might wonder that doesn't, you might think it doesn't concern you, but when you are getting married, it's good for you to know what might come up ahead so that you can avoid those things. So therefore, this is important for everyone. The last things that we move on to are common things that can destroy the love in the marriage. We see in front of us some of the common things that can destroy the love in the marriage. According to what even non-Muslim researchers have said, some said it is power struggles. And that brings us to the importance of appreciating what are the roles of the husband and wife in Islam according to the Quran and Sunnah. I want to point out right at the outset now that some of our views that we, we may have held from before, as we grew up watching movies, reading novels, listening to people here and there who may not have known much about Islam, some of the ideas that we may have in our mind about the role of a husband and wife in marriage might actually be quite harmful to ourselves, although we don't realize it. But when we look at the roles of husband and wife, it's good for us to be open-minded to the Qur'an and to the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Be open-minded because after all, the Qur'an and sunnah are the guidance of Allah, the all-knowing, the most wise, who created us and has perfect knowledge about how to help us live the life with love forever in the best way. So then, the roles of husband and wife, according to Islam, is a very important section and it is no less important that we should be with an open mind as we approach this topic. Some other things that people have said, researchers have said, that are common things that can destroy the love in the marriage so that we can avoid the, these, these things are external interferences, such as from your parents, your mother-in-law, or your brother-in-law, sister-in-law, or your other relatives, or friends. Another of the common things that can destroy the love in the marriage, financial difficulty, change of priorities in life, losing track of the real purpose of marriage. We'll come and look at these things soon, inshallah. Problem solving in marriage is the very last section we'll have a look at. It's just a brief small section, but it does help us at what is the way of Islam to help us when things, you've tried everything, it didn't seem to work, what do you do now? That's the last of our topic. We'll finish off with a few interesting trivia about husband, about wife, about marriage, and with that, we will end the course when we do it. As for now, though, we'll be having a look, as we said before, at the brief review of fiqh of marriage and those topics that you see in front of us there. Of course, we begin anything with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with praise for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the salat and salam, with the peace and blessings on his messenger Muhammad and his family, his companions, and whoever followed him doing good, doing well, following the guidance of Allah until the day of judgment. With this, we begin having a brief overview of the fiqh of marriage itself. I cannot emphasize enough that it is important for us to at least have some idea of the fiqh or jurisprudence or the way to go about marriage, the laws, the rules of marriage, according to Islam and the fiqh of Islam. That's what we'll be looking at now. As I put on the screen here, and I keep repeating this during the whole course, the title of the course, of course, is In Love Forever, an Islamic marriage course. But what I wrote here, as you see on the screen, and I continue this throughout the whole course, reminding ourselves is marriage is created to succeed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created the marriage to succeed. This is so important because I remember reading from some of the non-Muslim people on the internet who, subhanAllah, mentioned that marriage biologically, a marriage is not meant to succeed more than seven years. They said biologically, human being, biologically, humans or animals, they only remain with one partner, one spouse for seven years. That is, of course, absolutely incorrect and furthest from the truth. As we will see in the rest of this course, marriage in reality, Allah created it to succeed for the rest of our life, not only in this life, but eternally in paradise, to succeed by giving us that love, mercy, tranquility forever, which is what marriage was meant to be. Let's now begin by having a brief look at the fiqh of marriage. 
As I mentioned, these are some of the technical points. We'll be looking at them very, very quickly. We won't spend too much time. The idea from this section is for us just to be aware of it. And perhaps at another time, we may do an in-depth course about the fiqh of marriage itself. It really is interesting stuff, but it does take time to go through it all. Now, as I mentioned, we're just looking at a brief review. So don't expect us now to go too much in depth on these topics. This is for the purpose of us being aware of what marriage is all about, how it is in Islam according to the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we talk about marriage, we want to first know who are the people that you're not allowed to get married to. Some people forever, some people temporarily, and that is what we'll be looking at now. So as we see here, people prohibited to marry forever. That's the first type of people. They are people whom we are not allowed to marry due to blood ties or fostering. Due to blood ties or fostering. So the people who we are not allowed to marry forever, amongst them some are due to blood ties and some are due to foster relationships. Of course, some are also when we get married to somebody else, as we see that in the next point, prohibited to marry as a result of marriage. But now in this first point, let's look at the people who we are not allowed to marry due to blood ties or fostering in young age. When we talk about foster, foster parents, what we mean is when a baby is young, less than two years of age, baby, young, less than two years of age, dependent on milk as the main source of, its, of the baby's food and nourishment, they may still be having a little bit of other food, but dependent on the mother's milk or milk as the main source of food, during that time within the first two years, for however long it goes up to two years, at that time, if another lady gave milk to your baby for five times and gave milk that is f satiating and satisfying, so the baby drank, drank, drank in one go until they were satisfied, that's one lot of suckling. And if they did that on five occasion during that period when they're dependent on, on milk, as their main source of food, then if a woman did that to another woman's baby, then that first woman who suckled the other woman's baby, she becomes the foster mother. She becomes the foster mother. Now that foster mother, her husband becomes the foster father of that baby. And the foster mother and foster father, all their children also become brothers and sisters to that baby that they suckled. <coughs> and this foster relationship is only to do with that baby who received that milk, that he now has a new foster mother, foster father, and foster brothers and sisters. And it is only to do with the baby that received the milk. That baby that received the milk, his or her own brothers and sisters don't come into this equation. It's only the one who received the milk. The he now or she now has a new foster mother, foster brother, foster sister, foster father, foster grandfather, foster grandmother, foster uncle, and so on and so forth. So these blood ties and foster relationship for suckling the baby, these prohibit the following people from us marrying them. That is the mother, the grandmother, the mother and the grandmothers, not allowed to marry them. Daughters and granddaughters, not allowed to marry them as well. Sisters, not allowed to marry them as well. Sisters meaning the one who you share your father or, and or mother with. Maternal aunts, meaning your mum's sister. Paternal aunts, meaning your dad's sister. Not allowed to marry them as well. Sister's daughter, meaning your own sister's daughters. You're not allowed to marry her as well. Your own brother's daughter, you're not allowed to marry her as well. So these are the people we are not allowed to marry. Let's just have a little pause here briefly and appreciate that what, are, what is some of the benefit in not marrying these people? One of the benefits in not marrying these people, of course, they are very closely related to you. And as a result of which, your genes might be not becoming mixed with other genes from further away. That, of course, as we know, can, that can contribute if it continues generation after generation in an exaggerated manner, where you just generation after generation, you marry very, very close relatives, like your first cousin, 
then after a few generations, it might cause some inherited birth defects. That's one thing that could happen, but it usually doesn't happen that people generations after generations do that. But there is another thing as well where it, it adds up and makes sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited us from marrying these close relatives. And that reason is, if you think about it, imagine there's a father who has a little baby daughter. That baby daughter now looks up to that father to protect her, to do everything she needs to be cared for, looked after, loved for, and protected from everybody else in the society who might be harming her. Now imagine if it was not prohibited for a father to marry his own daughter, if it was not prohibited, then this father may be looking at his own daughter in a lustful manner for his own self-satisfaction instead of caring for her, instead of protecting her while she's looking up to him, desperately dependent on him as a little baby, he might actually be looking at her in this mean way. And therefore, it makes a lot of sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade us to marry such close relatives who are there to be helping us, looking after us, instead of hunting us and being a predator with these little innocent little girls as being their preys. So then I hope we can see that there is a lot of wisdom, some we may understand, and a lot more wisdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. These people that I mentioned just now, that so you're not allowed to marry your mother and grandmother who is, you, who is from your blood relations, and likewise not allowed to marry mother and grandmother who is due to suckling, meaning the lady who breastfed you when you were less than two years old, five full satisfying feeds. If she becomes your mother, even her even her own mother, which is your foster grandmother, you cannot marry her. her your own sister, meaning that foster mother's daughter, you cannot marry her, and so on. So all these who are forbidden from blood ties, they're also forbidden from foster relations as well. The second type of relations that we're prohibited from to marry are as a result of marriage, and that is the wives of the father. So whoever our father married, because our mother might have died in young age, or the father may have gotten divorced from the mother. And then after that, after the death or divorce, the father may marry another woman, or even during their lifetime. So then, if the father marries any women that the father marries, then they are all prohibited for us to marry. Likewise, your own son's wife, your daughter-in-law, is also prohibited to marry as well. The mother of a wife is also prohibited to marry. So you're now married to a wife, her mother becomes prohibited to you. Also, daughters of wives from previous husband, daughters of wives from previous husband of that wife, provided he consummated with his new wife. So this one is talking about, this one is talking about, so you now have a wife, and this wife has had daughters from before. You've got a wife, and she's had daughter from before, from a previous husband. So that daughter from a previous husband, she now becomes prohibited for you to marry as well. The, then there are some people who are prohibited to marry temporarily. And that is for a short time. When I say temporarily, let's have a look what we mean. First of them, as you see on the screen, are people you're prohibited to marry are two sisters at the same time. So let's say you're married to your wife, you cannot marry her own sister because you can appreciate that two sisters are there to look after one another, care for one another, look, for one, look after the needs of one another, be there when they need them. If now you married both of them at the same time, at the same time, then it will bring that jealousy between the two wives and you can imagine how much damage you would do. And another type that you're not allowed at the same time temporarily is you're not allowed to marry a woman, your wife, and at the same time her paternal or maternal niece or auntie at the same time. You're not allowed to marry your wife and her paternal auntie or her maternal auntie as well. Why is that? Again, for the same reason that we just saw before, that that relationship is there to look after them. And if you did that, you can imagine the jealousy that it will bring in the, amongst the two of them and destroy the love and care that they have for one another. Also, a woman who you are married to, a woman who is married to another man, of course, it goes without saying, you can't marry a woman who's married to another man. 
Also, number four, you're prohibited to marry while you are in the state of ihram, while you're doing hajj, because while you're doing hajj in the state of ihram, you are dedicated yourself completely to the worship of Allah, travel to Mecca, to Kaaba from far away. That's not the time for you to be trying to look to get married. So that's one time where you're not allowed to marry as well. So these are te te temporary prohibitions on marriage. So then if a husband gets a divorce from his wife, then after the divorce, he can marry that ex-wife's sister. So that's what we mean by it being temporary. You can look at the evidences of these, but we don't have time for them in this short review that we're doing now. Then people that you are prohibited to marry, apart from the ones we've seen before, it is prohibited for a Muslim to marry a mushrik or a kafir. So a Muslim is not allowed to marry a Hindu, for example, who worships many gods. So a Muslim is not allowed to marry any kafir or mushrik with the exception that we will see in the next point the next point is muslim women they can only marry muslim men so for muslim women they cannot marry a mushrik who is a hindu for example and they cannot marry a kafir non-muslim who is a christian or a jewish person as well even if they are people of the book a muslim woman cannot marry them point number three a muslim man can marry a woman of Ahlul Kitab. So a Muslim man can marry a Christian woman or a Jewish woman who are pious and are not having secret relations or boyfriends or girlfriends. They're not loose people. So a Muslim man can marry such a woman from Christian or Jewish people. Now, this was the case when Muslims lived in a Muslim society where there was a Muslim way of life and thus the man would be the head of the family, the breadwinner, and it would help him to steer the family in piety, even if his wife was not a Muslim and she was Ahlul Kitab. However, in our society today, where that is not the case, it might be quite inadvisable for a Muslim man to marry a Ahlul Kitab woman, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Having said that, that a Muslim man is allowed to marry a woman of Ahlul Kitab, let's not forget as I wrote there, that it's better for a Muslim man to marry a pious Muslim woman instead of marrying someone who is Ahlul Kitab. Because as Allah subhanahu wa says in the Quran about kafir people, Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى النَّارِ وَاللَّهُ يَدْعُوا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ وَالْمَغْفِرَةِ بِإِذْنِ Allah says they, meaning the non-Muslims, if you married them, Allah is saying they will be inviting you to hellfire, whereas Allah is inviting you to his paradise and forgiveness with his permission. So then it's better for us to marry someone who is a Muslim. And in fact, we're not allowed to marry someone who's not a Muslim, except with this last exception of a Muslim man marrying a Christian or a Jewish woman. But even then, it's better to marry a pious woman with Iman who is a Muslim and a Mu'min. That is better for you, better for your kids later on. And not, it's better to build your future of your kids marrying someone who inshallah will help them and steer them and invite them to paradise and not to hellfire. Let's now have a look at the engagement itself. As I said, we'll go through this briefly because we'll come through this, we'll come to this topic in depth during the course itself. When you're getting engaged to a woman, according to Islam, according to the Sharia, it is permissible to look at the woman who you are proposing to marry. So then, it was narrated that Abu Huraira said, I was with the Prophet ﷺ when a man came to him and told him that he had just married a woman from the Ansar. The Messenger of Allah ﷺ said, Anadarta ilayha, have you looked at her? He said, no. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Unzur ilayha fa inna fi a'yunil ansari shay'un wa ya'ani al-sigar. He said, go and look at her, the woman who you are intending to marry. Go and look at her before you get married. Why? Because go and look at her for there is something in the eyes of the Ansar, and he meant this smallness that, that he was referring to. Now what this shows to authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim, what we learn from this is, and from many other hadith as well, is it is good for you to look at the woman who you are about to get married, or also for a woman to look at the man she's about to get married, because at least if they feel that, okay, I can live with that person to say the least, and you might like them even more, that all helps for you to feel the attraction to that person and to give in that extra effort into your marriage. And that helps all the purposes of marriage, including looking after your children and so on. So there are a lot of benefits. We'll look at that in detail in the course later on. 
Let's now have a look at the marriage itself. Marriage is very simple in Islam. It's not meant to be an elaborate process. It's not meant to be a difficult thing. Marriage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it easy for the Muslim youth, the Muslim young boy and young girl to be able to get married because it helps them so much in this life to find that love and mercy and tranquility while they're married in this life. And it also helps the society by having a Muslim boy and a girl married bringing forth children, looking after them, and so on and so forth. So marriage is simple in Islam, and let's have a look at what are some of the essentials for an Islamic wedding, as we see on the slide in front of us. I mentioned here four, point, four points. Num let's have a look at number one. One, verbal offer and acceptance. So for a marriage to occur, and we'll look at this in a little bit more detail in the slides coming up, for a marriage to be valid, the, the bridegroom's welly, the guardian of the bridegroom, he that makes a verbal offer to the bride, to the bridegroom. Sorry, the guardian of the bride, the wali, makes a verbal offer to the husband to be the bridegroom by saying, I have married my daughter so and so to you. And then he does the acceptance. Yes, I have accepted so and so as my wife. This is called ijab, meaning giving that offer, and qabul, accepting that marriage. So this it, this is something that is what makes the marriage contract in Islam, both of these parties doing this from both sides. We'll look at that in detail later on. The second point that is an essential for an Islamic wedding is that there should be a Muslim wali to the bride. So the bride and bridegroom, of course, are the two most essential parties to the wedding, but the bride's father is her wali or her guardian, and we'll look at that wisdom later on, inshallah, in the course, when we do the course uh, for the whole day. But the bride's wali, her guardian, he, him, the bride and bridegroom, are three essential parties that need to be there, apart from the two witnesses, that is the next point that I mentioned. A Muslim wali, with his daughter's permission, gives her in marriage, and the bridegroom accepts the wedding with all his duties and responsibilities, as I mentioned, the verbal offer and acceptance, but the offer comes only once the wali has sought permission from his daughter, the bride-to-be. This should be done, point number three, this should be done in the presence of two witnesses, in the presence of two witnesses, such that the community knows that now these two people are husband and wife, therefore, then they expect them to be giving each other the rights and bear the responsibilities in the marriage as well and look after the society and the society looks after them as husband and wife. Thus, the importance of having two witnesses or more. Point number four, essentials of an Islamic wedding is to have a mahar. Mahar is like a little gift translated as dowry. It's a little gift that the husband gives to the wife at the time of the marriage. This is something that should be done uh, in an Islamic wedding. We'll have a look at that in detail shortly. Also, the walima or the wedding reception or a wedding feast is something that is strongly recommended to do. It might be done on the day of the wedding. It might be done the day after the wedding. It might be done sometime after as well, but it's preferable to do it before the husband and wife start living together to begin their relationship. So the essentials for an Islamic wedding Number one, verbal offer and acceptance. Number two, a Muslim wali, bride and bridegroom. Number three, two witnesses. Number four, the mahr, a gift given by the husband to the wife. Number five, or a point that goes either on that day or later on, is to do a walima to let everybody know in the society. The two witnesses help us also in case if there's disagreement between the husband, wife or the wali, the two witnesses are there to bear witness as to what exactly happened. But the walima helps to get the word out into this community, into the society, as I mentioned before, that the two are now husband and wife with rights and responsibilities. Again, let's now have a look at a little bit more detail of some of the points, which parties are necessary in the wedding. We mentioned the bridegroom, the bride, the guardian of the bride, which is the wali, and two witnesses. Who is the wali in the marriage? Wali or guardian is the bride's father, so long as he's alive and sane. If he is not alive or not sane, meaning he's so old, then the nearest male relative, that might be the father's father, it might be the girl's 
paternal uncle, it might be the girl's own brother, and so on, a nearest male relative, and there is a lot of detail about that. But firstly, it should be her father. But if there is no wali for her at all, like she might be a sister who just became a Muslim, and her father did not become a Muslim, nor did her brother or anyone, then, then if no male relative of hers that is close to her, like father and brother, did not become Muslim, then the leader of the Muslims takes the place of the wali and is the wali of that lady who has no Muslim wali. Notice though that a kafir person cannot be the wali over a Muslim person. The father of the girl, why is he the wali? Again, we'll have a look at the, we'll look at that in detail during the course itself because there's a lot of wisdom in it. We might not appreciate it in our society today, which is so materialistic, but let's have a look during the course at the importance of the wali and the wisdom therein. Hadith about the wali and two witnesses. We just had a look in the previous slide, the importance of having wali and two witnesses for the nikah. Nikah meaning the wedding or the marriage. Let's have a look at one hadith, a wali for the bride, which shows that wali for the bride is compulsory. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا نكاح إلا بوليين. There is no nikah, no marriage without a wali. That makes it as clear as the sun that there is no nikah except the wali. This hadith, it is an authentic hadith related by the five, meaning related by um, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, and Imam Ahmed, but without Imam al Nasai. So it's related by these four, and it is an authentic hadith. As I wrote there, Sheikh Al Albani and others class this hadith as an authentic hadith. There are some other chains of narration of this hadith and other variations that are not authentic. But this particular wording of the hadith, as well as the one that will come later on in the next slide, that they are authentic, which show that there has to be a wali in the marriage. There are few scholars who said, there are some scholars who understood though, that a wali should be there in the wedding, a wali should be there in the wedding, but if he's not there, such as Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, they understood that a wali should be there in the wedding, but if he's not there, they understood that the wedding is still valid. You don't say it's not valid. All, however, most of the scholars of Islam did not see it that way. They understood it the way the hadith says in front of us that there is no marriage except with the wali. I'll leave you to look into those details if you want later on, but suffice to say for now that the wali is very important for the wedding. And according to the hadith and most of the scholars in Islam, you, the wedding is not not valid without a wali. What I wrote at the bottom is a hadith that is related from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now this hadith that is related from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a lot of the scholars they mention about this hadith that it is authentic as a saying of a companion, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. However, it is not authentic that it is saying of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they said it's not the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but it's a saying of the, it is a saying of the companion radiallahu anhu only. However, that itself helps us because if the companion said it so categorically as in this hadith, then it must be something that he must have gotten from the Prophet sallallahu If he said so in such a categorical way, at least it has a basis from the Prophet sallallahu Look at the wording. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu says, لا نكاح إلا بوليين وشاهدي عدلين he says there is no marriage except with a wali and two witnesses. Now the fact that he said there has to be a wali and two witnesses specifically, this gives us the indication, not 100%, but a very strong indication that having two witnesses, Ibn Abbas who did not just come up from his own ijtihad, but he must have heard it from the Prophet wasallam. And therefore, he said it so categorically that there have to be witnesses and there must be two witnesses. Not only Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, but other Sahaba as well practice on this as well as we will see shortly. Therefore, it shows to us that you need to have a wali for the marriage and you need to have two witnesses as well. If the hadith is not authentic as saying of the Prophet sallam, but it is a saying of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, and it may well be that it's not his ishtihad, but it is from the Prophet himself, وسلم, and whatever be the case, it's related from many Sahaba such that it must have got its basis from the Prophet and thus a part of the religion. 
And as a result, a vast majority of the scholars in Islam, they said so, that you need to have two witnesses during the marriage. When they said two witnesses, they said two male witnesses, two male witnesses, and as we'll see later on, few scholars, they said, maybe one, if you didn't have two male witnesses, then one male witness and two female witnesses. That's the saying of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and Ishaq ibn Rahawai, as we'll see shortly. This hadith is collected by Dara Qutni and classed as an authentic saying of Ibn Abbas, by Sheikh al-Albani and others, whereas some other scholars class it as an authentic saying of the Prophet The difference of opinion is there, but as I mentioned earlier, even if it is a saying of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, then still it bears witness and evidence that we need to have two witnesses for the reasons I just mentioned before. We look at another hadith that shows the extreme importance of ensuring that there is a wali for the bride in the wedding. The Prophet ﷺ says in this authentic hadith that is related in Sunan al-Tirmidhi and verified to be Hassan authentic by Imam al-Tirmidhi himself and with other narrations classed as Sahih, authentic, by Shaykh al-Albani rahimahullah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says in this hadith, أَيُّمَا إِمْرَأَةٍ نَكَحَتْ بِغَيْرِ إِذْنِ وَلِيِّهَا فَالنِّكَاحُهَا بَاطِلْ فَالنِّكَاحُهَا بَاطِلْ فَالنِّكَاحُهَا بَاطِلْ فَإِنْ دَخَلَ بِهَا فَلَهَا الْمَهْرُ بِمَا اسْتَحَلَّ مِنْ فَرْجِهَا فَإِنْ اشْتَجَرُوا فَالسُلْطَانُ وَلِيُّ مَنْ لَا وَلِيَّ لَهُ There is so much we benefit from this hadith. Aisha radiallahu anha narrates from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he said, whichever woman marries without the permission of her wali, her marriage is invalid. Her marriage is invalid. Her marriage is invalid. If he entered into her, meaning consummated the marriage, if he entered into her, then the mahar is for her in lieu of what he made permissible from her private part. If anyone quarrels, then the Sultan is the Wali for the one who has no Wali. Meaning if people quarreled about matters to do with the Nikah, about who is the Wali or the Wali, about who is the Wali or is the Wali being unfair, then the Sultan, meaning the ruler of the place, is the Wali for the one who has no Wali. When the Hadith says the Sultan is the Wali, the scholars pointed out that Sultan is the one who has Sultan, who has power, meaning the Muslim leader is the Wali of the woman who has no other Muslim Wali at all. Now, the Muslim ruler is the wali, but the Muslim ruler is going to be quite busy. So then, therefore, as the scholars pointed out, the Muslim ruler appoints a wakil, appoints a person on his behalf who will be the wali for the girl. Often, though, this person who the Muslim ruler appoints tends to be the qadi, meaning the judge in an Islamic court. Because when someone is being wali for somebody else, it's good for them to know what's best for that girl, and it's good for them to also know some Islamic rulings as well. So then the Qadi is an ideal person to be the Wali for the girl. If the Qadi is not able to, if the Qadi is not there, for example, in a country such as Australia or a non-Muslim country where Muslims are a minority, there is no Muslim leader, nor is the Muslim judge of an Islamic court. If that is not there, then as the scholars pointed out, then you have the leader of the community. And if the community does not have one leader because they're divided, then the leader of a section of the community where the, that, per, that girl belongs to. That leader of that section of that community will be her wali. Um, again, as I mentioned, if the leader is busy, they may appoint someone else to be a deputy on their behalf, to be an attorney, a wakil acting on their behalf, but the wali still remains the leader himself. The earlier part of the hadith says, whichever woman marries without the permission of her wali, her marriage is invalid, her marriage is invalid, her marriage is in, in, invalid. The Prophet ﷺ repeats that three times and it just shows how strongly the Prophet ﷺ is conveying the message to us that a wali is a must in a marriage, in a, in a wedding, and a girl, a bride, cannot just marry on her own without her wali's permission. However, this comes, with, this comes not categorically, so meaning if the wali is being extremely unreasonable to the girl, such that suitable people come proposing to her for marriage and he refuses, more suitable people come, he refuses for no reason, he does that repeatedly, then the scholar said the leader comes into the picture and has a look at it and investigates and if the father is not willing to budge and be fair and just to the girl and look after her interests along with his own feelings as well, balance between the two, then the ruler becomes the wali of that woman, of that bride. There are other things to look at in this hadith, but because it's a brief introduction, we'll move on to the next part. 
Again, the previous hadith that we saw shows to us about the, the hadith about the wali shows to us a few things. Another thing it shows to us is about the need to have two witnesses in a marriage contract. That hadith we saw earlier, as you see on the screen now, from the one that we mentioned about Ibn Abbas anhu saying about this, Imam al-Tirmidhi wrote in his book of Sunan, in the Kitab al-Nikah, chapter 16, after mentioning hadith of witness, that it is from the companions, meaning it is a mawquf hadith, a saying of the companion and not of the Prophet Sallallahu Imam al-Tirmidhi himself mentioned that, and after that he says, this is what was their practice, this is what their practice was upon. Meaning, the fact that you must have two witnesses to the wedding is what the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu this is how they all did the wedding. Meaning, it must have got basis from the Sunnah, they all did it in this way, that's the way they practiced it. So Imam al-Tirmidhi rahimahullah says, this is what their practice was upon, the scholars from amongst the Prophet's companions, the Tabi'un, their followers, and others. They said, there is no nikah marriage except with witness. Imam al-Tirmidhi continues to say, none among those who passed away from them disagreed in that, except some scholars from among the later ones. So Imam al-Tirmidhi is saying, all the early scholars agreed that there have to be two witnesses to a marriage. It's only later on that some scholars disagreed over reasons that we cannot go into now. Imam al-Tirmidhi continues to saying, and this is just for more for benefit, and it's a bit too, too much for us to go into it in depth now, but I'll just read it for benefit of those who want to. The scholars, and now I'm reading what is there on the slide for the benefit of those people who may be listening to this purely on audio with no video slides in front of them. Imam al-Tirmidhi continues to say, the scholars only disagreed in this if one after another bore witness, so most scholars of Kufa and others said, Nikah is not permissible unless two witnesses witness the wedding contract together. Two witnesses witness the contract together. Whereas some scholars of Medina, such as Imam Malik, some scholars of Medina held the view that if one after another witnessed the wedding, then it is permissible if they publicized it. This is the saying of Malik ibn Anas and others. This is what Ishaq said in what he related from the people of Medina. Some scholars said, witness of a male and two females is permissible for nikah, and that is a saying of Ahmed, meaning Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and Ishaq. This is the quotation of Imam al-Tirmidhi, rahimahullah, from the Sunan al-Tirmidhi. I won't go into it in depth because it will take us too long. We focused on what was important from this slide for us at the moment. Let's now put together what we've had a look at about the wedding itself. Putting it all together, before we move further, how is the wedding done in Islam? A lot of the people now in Australia, New Zealand, and these countries, we probably see wedding as we grow up on TV, the way people get up, get married in different religions, in other religions. And we may not know much about how people get married in Islam at all. Let's then put these things together and have a brief look on this slide as to how is the wedding or nikah performed in Islam. As you can read on the slide, firstly, khutbah or the sermon. The khutbah is delivered by the marriage celebrant. The marriage celebrant who delivers the khutbah might be the husband himself, as the Prophet ﷺ was in his own wedding. Or it might be the wali, as the Prophet ﷺ was to some of his daughters. Or it might be the imam of the Muslims, meaning imam of a mosque, or leader of a community, or the judge or qadi, or the imam of a Muslim country. They might be the marriage celebrants. So the khutbah is delivered by the marriage celebrant, preferably begin, beginning with khutbatul haja, as related by Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. Then further advice is given in the sermon and from Islam, and then dua. The khutbah, as the scholars pointed out, such as in Hashir of Ibn uh, Qasim, um, on Zad al-Mustaqni', they said that the khutbah is done before the marriage contract. Before the marriage contract, preferably, it's good to do it before the marriage contract. Then, after that, the wedding itself, the wedding itself happens, whereby the wali of the girl seeks permission from the bride, either now on the spot or before coming to this spot. Seeks permission, do you want to marry such and such a person, mentioning the name of that person so that there is no mistake. And if she is someone who's previously unmarried, she may be shy, she may not want to say publicly, yes, I want to marry him. So she might just smile and be quiet 
and that as long as it indicates clearly that yes, she wants to marry this man, his name has been mentioned, that is an approval. If she has previously been married, then the Prophet ﷺ informed us that she should verbally say it because by then some of her shyness would have now, she would have overcome that. Once that's done, the wali on the day of the wedding says to the bridegroom, he says, I as the wali, now the permission of the bride, it's good to seek it right there and then as well or just before that. Then the wali says, I as the wali of, I, as the wali of such and such a girl have married such and such a girl or her, he mentions her by the name to you and he mentions the name of the bridegroom. This in Arabic is called ijab. So for example, he might say, I as the wali of Khadija have married Khadija to Muhammad. Of course, Khadija was the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu and Muhammad was the Prophet Sallallahu himself. So notice that the wali, he says, I have married. And you know, he says it definitely without any doubt. He mentions the fact that he's the wali of this girl and mentions the girl by name. And he says that he's marrying her by name. He's giving her in marriage to whom he mentions the name of the bridegroom as well. These all should be mentioned by the wali in the marriage. Now, he, does he have to say that in Arabic? He doesn't really have to say it in Arabic. He may say it in any of his language, but provided that these things are mentioned clearly without any doubt or hesitation. Then the bridegroom does the qabul, meaning the acceptance. The wali has already done ijab, the offer. Now the bridegroom is doing the qabul or acceptance by saying, I have accepted Khadija as my wife. So he mentions her name. And it's even better to say, I have accepted Khadija, the daughter of, um, of Mahmud, for example. So just so there is no mistaking about who the person you are referring to. So with this, the, married, the wedding happens. Once the above is said in the presence of two male witnesses, then it is optional to write and sign it. If you write it and sign it, it just helps such that people later on do not dispute and other people have that in writing and proof. Otherwise, even without writing and signing it, just merely having the two witnesses suffices to having um, veracity that this marriage has occurred. The mahar is specified loudly or privately during the marriage itself. It might be specified loudly, publicly if you want to, but it might be done privately as well so that you're not showing off. Because sometimes people might just put the mahar up high for the guy the wali might put the mahar up high or the daughter, the bride might put the mahar high on the bridegroom just so publicly they can say, I demanded so much mahar and I was worth of such a big amount of mahar. So the mahar may be specified loudly, but if you want to avoid these problems, you may specify it privately between all the above mentioned parties. So the mahar is specified in front of the, the wali of the girl and the bridegroom himself and is good for the bride herself to be there either directly there or at least to know about it as well before that and the mahar is good to mention it as well you mention the mahar in front of the two witnesses in fact you should mention it in front of the two witnesses such that there is no dispute of it later on the mahar itself it may be given right there and then at the time of the wedding or the husband might give the mahar even before the wedding or he may delay it and give it a little bit after the wedding. But he must give it, it's compulsory for him to give the mahar, and it becomes compulsory from the time of the wedding contract. And he should give it either then or later, unless if the bride pardons and forgives some or all of that mahar, then he doesn't need to give that much of the mahar. It's highly recommended then after that to do a walima, the wedding feast and reception, either immediately right there and then on that day itself or later on after the above nikah is, is completed to announce the marriage publicly. The walima might be done, as I said, on the same day, the next day or three months later, six months later. But the purpose of the walima is to let the people know that this man and woman who are now walking publicly together, they are not strangers, but their husband and wife. Therefore, I hope we can appreciate that the walima really should be done before the husband and wife consummate the marriage by living together or they begin their marriage by having private relations. Before that, the walima should be done ideally. 
But if it cannot be done because they can't afford it, it may be done later on. But really, ideally, it should be done before that stage. So this is how a wedding is done. Khutbah, wali seeking permission of the bride, wali offering the bride, the bridegroom accepting the bride, this being done in the presence of two witnesses, mahar being specified in front of these all and given there or earlier or later, and then do the walima after all of this. This is how an Islamic marriage is done. Let's have a look now at what mahar itself is briefly just so we have an idea. Because as you know, in some countries around the world, such as in the Indian subcontinent, in some areas, the mahar is turned upside down. In Islam, in Islam, the husband-to-be pays and gives the mahar as a gift to the wife, to the wife, because he is the earner, the breadwinner of the family as well. Whereas amongst the Hindus, it is the opposite. The girl's father has to give big dowry to the boy and that becomes quite hard on him especially if he has two three four girls to look after so that, that's not the way of islam let's have a brief look at what mahar itself is in islam what is mahar again let's just have a quick look at the slide for purpose of those who don't have the slide to look at and are merely listening to this as an audio mahar is a gift-like offering from the husband to the wife the amount of which is agreed upon between the bridegroom bride and the wali it may be given at the time of marriage or before it or after it even by years as long as it is the delay as long as the delay is accepted by the other party mahar should be in the form of gold silver currency or if not then goods of monetary value such as a ring as it was in the time of the prophet so then let's appreciate that the mahar that the guy gives to the girl it should be in the form of gold silver or currency because gold and silver were currency in those days gold coins silver coins if not at least as some items of goods and items of monetary value such as a ring which is what a man gave the process some suggested to a man to give a ring of iron ring of metal iron to the woman if he didn't have a ring of gold so that's the next choice as we see there and if only and only if, the, if this is all not possible at all due to the bridegroom's lack of financial ability, then it may be that other actions or services of financial value may be given as mahar. So the Prophet ﷺ, if you remember the long hadith, the Prophet ﷺ accepted the man who did not have any money to give, not even a ring made out of iron. He couldn't even give that to his wife-to-be in mahar. So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, that have you memorized any Quran and he said yes so the Prophet ﷺ made that the mahar that he teaches that Quran to the wife now teaching Quran is a act it's a service that is worth some money so therefore he couldn't give the goods right there and then so the Prophet ﷺ told him to give some service to the wife that is worth monetary value knowing given that he is able to give that to her low and affordable values for mahar are the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as in the hadith that we'll see in the next slide excessive mahar though it is allowed but it is disliked among some Muslims unfortunately they demand huge mahar from the husband to be as a result of which the poor guys cannot afford to get married until they're well into the 30s and it's so late for them to get married and the girls are waiting waiting until a guy is able to give so much mahar to her so it's not good for him nor is it for her so then the prophet ﷺ encouraged us to keep the marriage to keep the mahar low and not to have it very high the prophet ﷺ himself it is related that he never gave more than 12 uqiyah of mahar uqiyah 12 uqiyah is equivalent to each each um, uh, each of them is equivalent to 40 dirham 12 uqiyah are equivalent to 480 dirham meaning the silver coins in those days now that 480 dirham is not 480 grams of silver no it's 480 dirham of those days this we see in the in the hadith now over the page in the next slide allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the importance of giving mahar allah says and give the women their bridal gifts graciously as it is in surah an-nisa verse number four also 
the compulsory nature of the mahar can be appreciated from the hadith about the man that I just mentioned before, who did not even possess any money, not even for a metal ring for mahar. So as last resort, the Prophet ordered him to teach the Qur'an, he knew to the bride as a mahar. This shows that mahar must have been important and compulsory, otherwise the Prophet would have waived it from him. But it just shows that mahar is compulsory. The hadith that I put on the screen is very important for our times, as I just mentioned before. The Prophet says, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وسلم, خَيْرُ النِّكَاحِ أَيْسَرُهُ The best of the marriages is the easiest one of them, is the easiest one. So the best of the marriages is the one where the mahar is made easy, the wedding itself is kept simple. In some parts of the Muslim world these days, people have got so much show off in their hearts that they want to do bigger and bigger wedding. That's not the way of Islam. The Prophet says the best wedding is the easiest one. And that's related in Sunan Abu Dawood and classed as, as, as authentic Sahih by Sheikh Al-Albani and others as well. The Walima, briefly looking at it, as I mentioned earlier, Walima is highly recommended in Islam. Even if you don't have much money, at least a Walima with just a little bit of food is good to do. Highly recommended in Islam. And let's have a look at a couple of hadith to do with that. Abdullah bin Umar relates that Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, if any one of you is invited to a walima, he must go for it. So this shows that although walima to do it itself is highly recommended, but if someone invited you to the walima, then it is compulsory for you to respond and go. Unless, of course, if there is haram happening at that wedding, like big time haram happening at that wedding, then you should not go there. As we see from the Sahaba of the Prophet وسلم, when they went to a walima or an invitation, and there was haram happening there, then they simply walked away and walked back. You can see this in authentic narrations in elsewhere as well. So if you go, if you're invited to a walima where there is haram happening, you are not obliged to go. In fact, you should not go. If you're invited, invited to a walima, whereas you've already got a appointment from before on that day at that time, and you simply cannot make it to the walima, then you do not need to go. Then you do not need to go. This is something that is important so that Islamic classes and other things, if you already have an appointment to attend an Islamic class from before and someone invites you to the walima, then it's good to say to them, well, look, I'm happy to come to the walima, but I need to go to this Islamic class for one hour and then I'll be there at the walima. It's because you've already had that appointment from before. Abu Musa anhu relates that the Prophet ﷺ said, set the captives free, accept the invitation, meaning to the walima, accept the invitation and visit the sick person. These, this and the early hadith are both in Sahih Bukhari, an authentic hadith, and it shows that accepting the invitation to walima, it is compulsory. Abu Huraira anhu relates in the next hadith, the worst food is that of a walima to which only the rich are invited while the poor are not invited. And he who refuses an invitation disobeys Allah and his messenger. So this hadith is very important for us. It shows not to have this hard set economic class in a society where there are rich and poor and never do they meet. The Prophet is saying the worst food is that of a walima to which only the rich are invited while the poor are not invited. So then uh, this shows to us that if you are doing a walima Invite all your guests and your friends and your relatives, sure, but at the same time, do invite a few poor people as well so that you are not doing the wrong thing that this hadith is prohibiting. Abu Huraira also says, as the Prophet said, if I'm invited to a meal of trotters, I'll accept it, and even if I am given a trotter as a present, I'll accept it. It's in Sahih al Bukhari. Basically, it just shows that even if the walima just has simple food, you should still go to it, and you shouldn't say, oh, well, I was expecting this great quality delicious food, how come there's only these tiny little dates and milk and water for the walima? You should go no matter what there is to the walima. So far we've looked at the wedding itself. Let's have a look now. We've had a look at the wedding itself. Let's have a look now at the divorce and matters related to the divorce. 